Elliot Stavina. I'm in my Adams Family Musical Done by Moses Lake High School t-shirt. It uh, got an award for costuming done by yours truly. And today I'm going to talk to you about costuming, characters, cultural appropriation, and kimonos. I love kimonos. They are absolutely beautiful pieces of wearable art. The efficiency that is used in making them because they were made of panels of fabric specifically out of looms that were narrower than what we're typically used to. And these panels are put together in such a way that you do not waste extra fabric. In fact, the extra volumes of fabric are a bonus to them. And other things about a kimono, it's not for an hourglass figure shape. It's not to hug your body. In fact, it kind of makes your body sort of a, a cylinder, but it's for um, the sensuousness of the neckline and the scandalous underarm. Yes, that's right. Instead of thinking of the bosom or the waist as sexy, Instead, in Japanese culture, it was the neck which was sensual. The scandal is that kimonos have a gap underneath the arms because that is scandalous. There's other cultural things about kimonos, like it's important that you know which way you layer it because if you put one side on top, it's normal. If you put the other side on top, it's for a funeral. Also, obis, those center wraps that you see a lot of lovely ladies wearing, never have them tied in front. Yeah, you'll always want the obi tied in the back. Well, you, who am I talking to? You, I mean, I am obviously not Asian. And I would find it very difficult to just walk around in a kimono without people going, excuse me, white lady, what are you doing? Ugh. So let's talk about kimonos a little bit and about cultural appropriation a little bit and characters and costumes because Halloween's coming up. I love this coat. This is sometimes called a happy coat or a haori coat. Again, white, I might be mispronouncing things. And I love wearing this. It is authentically from Japan. It's hand stitched, put together. I've worn it at different functions, uh, as a teacher, sometimes you just want something to put over the top. And this is not a kimono. And I've never had anyone question me as to whether or not I'm culturally appropriating this lovely jacket because this lovely throw-on coat uh, could come from a variety of cultures that have simple lines, boxy construction, and an efficient use of fabric. I happen to know that it is Japanese, but there are many other cultures that do things like this. Uh, you might want to reference things like the Stone Age bog coat uh, that was pulled out of, I think, Scotland? I'm not quite sure about that, but yeah, there's boxy, cool garments like this all around the world. So, um, let's talk specifically about kimonos and when white people should never wear them. There is a sad, long history of Caucasian people um, in various entertainment industries and like impersonating people of Asia, usually in a stereotypical and negative way, but even the illustrious Charlie Chan of you know, detective skills uh, was often portrayed by a white man with eye makeup and a terrible, terrible Asian accent. So this is whitewashing 
uh, Scarlett Johansson uh, was criticized for taking the role of the major in Ghost in the Shell, uh, a anime made in Japan, brought over to the United States, and uh, I don't blame her for being given a script and given the option to join in on the script. It's more um, who the directors were wanting to send that script to to be cast. They chose her for her star power and not a Asian descent uh, actress because they wanted her. Um, and I, I don't blame her for wanting to work. I, uh, I do blame the people in casting uh, for not trying to reach out to lesser known but also fantastic Asian actors. So how does that go into uh, white people wearing or not wearing kimonos? If you want to do a Japanese character that has a Japanese heritage and history you are probably going to be wearing a kimono. Whether you're doing Samurai X or whether you're doing um, a historical ghost. Now the actual character's name is, I believe it's pronounced Oiwa. That's the woman who dies in the story and comes back as a ghost. And she has several iconic symbols. One, is either a fully scarred or a partially scarred face from the poison that she was killed with. The other one is a magical lantern. Sometimes she only appears as the lantern floating by itself through the air. Sometimes she is holding a lantern. And in typical Kabuki style, ghosts are represented by the colors blue or green. So those are parts of taking on that ghost character. Now, there was a particular convention, I can't remember if it was a Norwest Con or if it was a Seattle Crypticon that I went to, where I uh, dressed up as different uh, characters from various cultures um, in the horror genre. Because, in my opinion, it shouldn't be left to just people of a culture to reach out to the wider Western white bread people to say, hey, we've got an ancient culture that's got ghost stories too. You should look at us because if everyone just stays in their own little bubble of knowledge and doesn't uh, reach out, you won't get to know as much. And uh, in that convention, I now think it was definitely Norwest Con because I was on a panel to talk specifically about costume and character and culture and cultural appropriation. And for that one, I chose to dress as that character. I dressed as that character all day long with the lantern and a scarred face, hair covering the makeup that was disforming that side of my face and beautiful makeup on the other side. That's how she gets you in some versions of the story. And uh, I kept track of how many people wanted to talk to me about my costume and whether their reactions to my costume were positive or negative. <clears throat> I got a lot of negative feedback from white people. Lots. Because here I am, Caucasian, though I had makeup on that may have made me look slightly less Caucasian. Um, still, I have a wig and such like that, but white, yeah. Uh, and they were uncomfortable with the fact that I was wearing this kimono in uh, blue and white, white being the color for funerals, carrying around this paper lantern and uh, just generally looking like a very creepy, I think I got called a creepy geisha at least 15 times. I'll have to look at my notes. It was several years back, but I got called that many times. And every time 
I jumped on them and I told them the ghost story that it was actually, and they would be, oh, 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 she's nerding out at me. Smile and nod. Oh, this is a, an actual character. You didn't just decide to be an undead geisha. You're actually being a real historically based character from a kabuki play that goes back to the 1820s or before and oh you did a lot of research that's a well researched costume lady i'm gonna escape now however i was approached by three people who looked to be of asian descent and all three of them said oh my gosh you're that ghost. You're, you're that. You're that character. And they knew who I was. In fact, one of them actually started talking to me in Japanese. And I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I took Spanish as a foreign language. My sister took Japanese as a foreign language in high school. I heard you say hello. What was the rest of that? And then they switched back into English. And they talked about how they loved how I had interpreted the character. Um, the details that I had put into it. And so when I finally got in front of the panel, I talked about this experience. The people from the actual culture that approached me appreciated the amount of detail that I had gone into in portraying a character from their culture. They liked it. However, the people from outside the culture knowing nothing about it, saw me as an interloper who was stealing and mimicking and making fun of the culture that I was dressed as. So that's something that you need to think about. Is what you're doing a mockery or a tribute and an homage to the culture that you're in? All right. So what does this have to do with the Adams Family musical? <sighs> Wonderful musical. I loved working on this musical and it was done with a high school and a high school cast. And high school casts are made up of whoever auditions. And in a musical, you have a um, dearth of males who audition. Um, in this production, uh, a number of the more gender ambiguous characters uh, were played by females, including the entire chorus. There wasn't a single boy on the entire chorus because there aren't a lot of boys in high school in vocal music, and if they are, not all of them want to be on stage and dancing and acting. Uh, so there's such a, a rarity of those characters that, um, yeah, you use all of the boys in the main cast and then the chorus is made up of ladies. So having to do costumes ones specifically that were supposed to be masculine, such as the conquistador and the soldier and other such uh, characters. I had to be creative and I had to work with the ethnicities of students that I had. Now, the director wanted the concept of being part of the Adams family is you just have to have more of the Adams family Je ne sais quoi. You have to have that uh, creepy and kooky aesthetic. And that makes you a member of the Adams family. The only way to be thrown out of the Adams family is to be boring. Yeah, if, if you are the basic, you might not fit in the Adams family. So the director wanted to have a multicultural chorus to kind of show the global uh, draw of that creepy and kooky family. So I wanted to have characters from 
every background, every continent. I wanted to have pre-European uh, American represented. I wanted to have Asia represented. I wanted to have Africa represented. It. And if we had had anyone who was black audition, and if you audition for a musical in high school, you pretty much always get in, even if it's uh, just in the uh, chorus group, uh, that would have been wonderful. I would love to have had a proud African chieftain or wise, you know, chiefess. Do they have chiefs? Is that a thing? But um, we didn't have anyone who was black audition at all. Uh, and so Africa had to be represented by Egypt because the Ptolemaic pharaohs were Greek and they had some Middle Eastern background, possibly Syria slash Persia, Turkey, maybe. Uh, and I know that uh, the actress Godot, Gadot, Wonder Woman, who is of Israeli background, is going to be playing Cleopatra soon, and some people are like, ah, oh, it's whitewashing. Well, the Ptolemaic pharaohs were Greek, so olive skin, that's going to be a thing. If there had been a black uh, actress, a singer, I would have asked her if she wanted to be one of the Nubian pharaohs from the upper Nile with beautiful dark skin and just sport the whole pharaoh thing like Nefertiti. Uh, but we didn't have that. So instead, uh, one of our Latina actresses said, I, I'd love to be Cleopatra. So she got to be Cleopatra. We did have one Asian actress. She did a fabulous job as the white witch in the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe the previous year. And uh, I believe she was Hawaiian, Asian, Latina. She was a beautiful mix of all sorts of cultures. And um, she was specifically given the role to react to the line, shot with an M16. M16s, I looked it up. They were used in the Vietnam War, but not before then. So I approached her. I said, okay, so you react to the line, shot with an M16. That's how your character died. That puts you in post-Korean War, Vietnam War era. What are you thinking? I could have just said, oh, you look Asian, you got the Asian aesthetic, I'm going to uh, make you look uh, Vietnamese. Rice hat, black pants, white shirt, bullet holes. When I asked her what she wanted, she didn't say soldier or Vietnamese, no. She said, oh, can I be uh, one of those hippie students that got shot, you know, at the college? Wow. Okay. She chose that. She wanted to be one of the uh, Ohio students who was shot by the National Guard. Okay, cool. That's what she wanted. She got to be a hippie. So I still needed a representative from Asia. So as we went around and around, uh, there were a lot of white girls left and I still had pre-European America and Asia uh, to cast. One of the girls said, you know what? My brother's got one of those arrow through the head things. I could totally do the Native American. Just don't make me in a short skirt like Pocahontas. We did have 
terrible Pocahontas-like costumes from a production of uh, South Pacific, which <laughs> has its own uh, fight against racism in it. But I didn't want to use any of those. Instead, I put her in the Mountain Man buckskin with the fringe on it, pants and top, and no feather headdress. Uh, instead, it was just simple uh, leather wrapped braids and the arrow through the head. So we come down to the end. Well, there was a girl with green hair. She ended up being the heretic. Instead of it being a heretic priest, it was a heretic nun so that we could cover the green hair without her having to re-dye it. I don't like making my kids change their hair. I mean, they're in high school, they need some freedom. And another Caucasian lady to represent Asia. And so I told her the ghost story. <laughs> and she loved it. And she wanted to be that character. And she even researched, she's like, oh, can I do the kimono fold so it's the, the funerary fold? Yes, you can do that. And um, what else can I do? And what else can I do? And so she made herself not that same ghost because she didn't want to have the disfigured face. She wanted to have a pretty face. So I'm like, okay, look up other traditional ghost stories. So I think she ended up being some other kind of drowned woman uh, Japanese ghost, which was fantastic. I liked working with my students to help them make their characters instead of saying, okay, well, you look Asian, so you're gonna actually have to play, you know, Asian heritage. And you look like this, so you're gonna have to be that. You are male, so you have to be a male character. You are female, so you have to be a female character. I worked with them so that we could have an array. Now, was that cultural appropriation? I was trying very hard to be respectful to each culture as it came up. I was not going to take a Latina woman, and well, a young woman, and turn her into a sub-Saharan African representative by blackfacing her. That was not cool. Was I okay with having another actress put on the garments of a traditionally Japanese horror character, you know, from their ghost stories. Yes. So where's the line? Well, I try very hard that when I cross that cultural barrier, I don't misrepresent that other culture. I'm not making fun of it. I'm not turning it into, oh, look how sexy this Native American mini skirt with the big feather headdress is. No, 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 no. Um, I want to represent them as authentically as I can within the budget that exists. And sometimes that means I gender bend a character. And sometimes that means that I have to shift the location that something is from, you know, greater African continent to just this little section of the northern African continent and Middle East. Um, and I think more of the importance is to just try to respect the culture that you're representing. Now, all that said, let's talk about doing some repairs on kimonos. Uh, the two places that I often have to do repairs on kimonos are the underarm seam and uh, around the neck. Uh, this lovely pink butterfly one, uh, it's a slight yellow color, uh, the side seams and arm seams need some repair. This was all hand sewn and around the neck has worn through. So 
that's a repair that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, when it comes to these two, this is the one I use as an inner uh, kimono because, um, yeah, sweat and this one can take a, a bit of a hot wash with white clothing. And uh, it also uh, could probably use a little bit of uh, fixing up in the uh, arm area. And definitely this blue one, which is modern construction, it is not hand stitched like those other two. This one was serged and stitched. Uh, it has <laughs> also ripped in the underarms. And why is that? Well, let me toss this on so that you can see. They just came out of the laundry and no, I haven't ironed them yet because I wanted to get on the video. So uh, traditionally, the sleeves are open here on the inside. And uh, I tend to uh, go through doors and I get caught on the door frames and it rips the sleeves. So I need to do a bit of repair. And I think how I will uh, solve that from happening is I'm going to stitch this up a little bit, at least on the one that would be the outermost layer, which for me usually is this blue one. Yes, I do wear them inside the house because um, there's something really nice and sumptuous about wearing a traditional piece of clothing. And if I were stuck to my own culture, I'd be in a chemise and kirtle. I just checked on the internet. Um, yes, there was a girdle, which was to hold all the bouncy bits, but there was also a kirtle, K-I-R-T-L-E which was the garment over the top of the chemise. So, yeah, I don't really feel like wearing a kirtle, but wearing a kimono around the house is a lot more elegant, and I appreciate them for that. So, <clears throat> to get this all started, I'm going to be replacing the neck liner for this pink and yellow kimono. I've got some food stains on it, but you can see up here at the neck, it's worn through. Now, I get all of my kimonos secondhand from the thrift stores. I've never ordered one or bought one directly. They're all thrift store finds. So if you do like I do, you're probably going to come with one that has a little bit of damage. So first thing is to start removing the, um, the part that's damaged. And if you've got one that's uh, authentically made in excuse the terrible camera, I'm trying to get it close enough because my tripod wasn't doing it, but um, because it's all hand stitched, I can pick out the hand stitches with my um, seam ripper and undo it rather easily. And that's one of the nice things about the hand stitched original kimonos. If you have one that's modernly made with a lot of machine stitching, it'll take a lot more work to get that piece undone. Once you have it off, uh, you can lay it out, uh, maybe iron it flat, and then you can make a copy of it onto another piece of cotton. The original had a selvage edge, and the other end edge was turned under. Um, I'm going to turn under both edges, so I'm cutting mine just slightly wider than the original piece. Sniff the fabric to the right length. And that's one of the nice things of when you're working with a simple garment that's all geometric shapes. It's very easy to lay out the parts that you need and make a copy off of the original garment. So now I need to match the same creases that are in the original on my replacement piece. It's got a fold and a fold and then a double fold, but it's not in half it's actually a little bit offset with one side being longer than the other. So it's in thirds and then one of the thirds gets folded in half again. Here I am at the ironing board in a different t-shirt because this was filmed on a different day. That's how it goes. I'm just going to first take out all of the wrinkles that are already in the fabric and then iron it exactly how it was in the original piece. I'm gonna do sort of a dry fit to make sure that it's fitting how I want it to on the collar of that kimono. It's looking pretty good. 
So I'm going to pin it in the same places, once in the center of the neck and then at both ends. And then I can bring it over to my sewing machine. I'm starting at the center back. That's always a good way to keep things from uh, creeping and slipping and sliding with your uh, feeder feet. Sometimes that can be an issue. And uh, if you start at the center and go out, you're not going to have it shift along too much where it will be uneven. Always remember to backstitch. Now, why did I decide to machine stitch this on? Um, I don't like to hand stitch. I mean, I will if I have to, which I'm going to when I get to the side seam. On the side seam, you can see where the original fabric was folded back and basted down. And I could undo all that basting stitch that they did by hand. Or I could do this particular little trick where you stitch sort of a, a box stitch Greek key where you go into the fabric, across and out, and into the other side of the fabric, across, and then back through. I'll try to get close enough so that you can see what I'm doing, but it's a way of kind of cheater doing hand stitching in a side seam when you don't want to have to open up a lining or like this, the basting stitch holding the edges down. Okay, that's about enough of that. I'm going to tie it off. And now look at the other kimonos. The white lining one, honestly, I don't think is that bad, so I'm just going to leave it be. Uh, but the blue one, I definitely need to do some work with. Uh, it's torn on both sleeves, but one is much worse than the other. The right side, of course, the one that gets caught on everything. But you can see where the material is actually ripped. So I'm going to show you how to do a patch and then a top stitch to keep that from getting worse. First, iron everything flat get out all the wrinkles because we're going to have to be doing some patchwork. We don't want to be stitching in wrinkles if that's not something we really want. Now that everything's smooth, I'm going to iron on an iron on patch. This is one of the lightweight ones. You don't want something as heavy as denim. Uh, this one's bright orange because it shows up really good on the camera. Plus, it's on the inside, so you're not going to really see it. I'm going to have it trimmed just to the size that I need it to be. And then I'm going to press it down right on the section that is torn. I make sure that my sewing machine has a comparable thread to whatever the color is on the other side. Now, I could have gone with a darker pink but I think the light pink will be the most invisible, particularly when I do a zigzag stitch over the top. I stitch around the outside of that patch. If I had a circular patch or a heart-shaped patch or a star-shaped patch, I would stitch whatever that was down first along the edges. This is a square, so I'm doing a square. Then I flip it over onto the right side and I do a short but wide zigzag stitch over the part that is frayed and torn apart. And that is going to hold down all of those edges so that they don't peel up and so that the rip won't come back. And after that, I'm just going to stitch up those sleeves uh, so that there's only a tiny gap in the underarm, but those sleeves are now sort of giant hanging bat wing pockets. All right, so now that I've sewn up those, and yes, I still need to trim my threads. I left my scissors in the ironing room. That's why it's good to have everything in one place. But if you can't, you end up running all over. So now that I've stitched that up, these are less likely to catch in door handles and handrails and things like that. And uh, because kimonos, typical of many uh, olden times clothing it doesn't have pockets I can now use this as a pocket for I don't know a book 
It's big enough. Now, here's the other thing. Remember, it's always left over right unless you're dressing a dead person like a ghost and then you put right over left. But left over right if you are alive. Leaves the hem and the neck liner are the first things that are going to go in a kimono and I'm not doing this with a mirror so I'm hoping that I'm getting the collar nicely lined up. So what can you do when one of those goes out? Well uh, you can always shorten the sleeve and use that material for another part. You can shorten the hem of the kimono, use that for another part. You can use a coordinating fabric like I did on the yellow and pink butterfly one. Uh, you can always completely change the sleeve, change it out for uh, two solid sleeves and then use that fabric for something else. What else? Well, I've used them for uh, masks. <laughs> Lots of masks. Of this coat that I love so much happens to uh, be printed on. And I know here in the West, we might consider that, oh, what a waste. Well, it's not a waste if this had been the sleeve of a kimono in the past. Um, I've used scrap kimono fabric as linings in masks that I've made. I've even used it as the front. This is a lovely koi pattern kimono fabric that I just had uh, lying around. And that neck lining that, uh, that I took off of the butterfly one, this one is probably going to get turned into the straps for some of my tie-on masks. So it all gets used and reused and reused until there's nothing left of the fibers. That's something that I, I really appreciate about the efficiency of these particular ethnic patterns because they do use the fabric in the most efficient way possible to get the maximum use out of the weaving. Thank you for joining me on this kaleidoscopic cruise when we try to decide when kimonos are traditional costume, a character cosplay, or the criminal crime of cultural appropriation. If you choose to wear an ethnic garment that's become a shorthand for a culture, be certain not to sexualize, vilify, or mock that culture when you are wearing their garments. Approach it all with research, respect, and responsibility. Have a great day.